Hey guys, welcome back. So today I want to talk a little bit more in depth about choosing a 30 caliber 308 762 by 51 fighting rifle over 556. Now in a previous video with the SIG 716i, I talked about that just a little bit, but talked more about the Indian Army adopting the 716i for their Northern Command. And in today's video, I kind of want to have more of a discussion around choosing 308 as a primary fighting rifle versus 556, focusing on the 760 by 51 NATO rifles. And by the end of the video, I'm going to tell you what I personally would choose if I were going to pick a 308 fighting rifle. But before we get started with today's video, guys, please like, share, and subscribe to the videos. It really, really does help us. A surprisingly small number of people that watch our videos actually subscribe. So please click that subscribe button, comment down below about what we talk about, and tell me what your choices might be. And that also helps with the algorithms. All right, with that being said, guys, let's get started with today's video. Guys, please swing by and check out Big Daddy Unlimited BDU. They help support us here at the Military Arms Channel with products and things like that so we can continue to bring you content. There's a link in the video description down below that'll take you to the Mac blog and website. Please follow that link and from there you'll find a link to Big Daddy Unlimited and try them out just for 99 cents. You can see what they're all about. In essence, they're just like a big online store that has amazing prices. So please, again, check out BDU. In today's video, we're going to show you several different rifles, and we're gonna start off today with the Colt 901. This is one of my favorite Colt rifles. The 901 was developed by Colt to be entered into the SCAR military trials, and because I'm not referring to it as the SCAR, obviously it didn't win the military trials. However, I actually think this rifle probably would have been the best choice of those submissions that were made, but that, of course, is open to debate. The 901, is a very neat rifle and probably one of the best rifles Colt designed. I don't believe they're making them anymore, and if they are, they're probably only selling them to law enforcement and military, but um, these things are almost impossible to find these days on the civilian market. But what makes the 901 special is, first of all, we have a monolithic upper up here with the 1913 rails present at the 12, 3, 6, and uh, 9 o'clock positions. And we have full ambi controls on the 901. So we have our mag release here, we have a, a bolt release here, which I can show you guys how that works. You just reach up and push that with their index finger, but to lock it open, you have to use the standard ping pong paddle over here. And then we have a magazine release over on the left-hand side as well. Fire controls here, nothing here, but an aftermarket solution would be available for that. So the 901, in its current configuration is 308, but another really cool feature about this rifle was its ability to go from a 308 to basically an M4. And that was accomplished by swapping out the buffer and spring here in the tube, and it was sold as a, a kit for the civilian market. And then you would take the upper off this rifle, bolt carrier and all, and then you would put a magazine well adapter in here, just slides right in, and then you would pin your M4 upper to this lower and it was now a 5.56 rifle, so it could go back and forth and had parts commonality with weapon systems already in U.S. inventory. It just made a lot of sense. I've also found that the 901 is a very accurate rifle. It shoots really, really good. And so it's just a great firearm in terms of, in terms of being 30 caliber. A little bit extra weight out here because of the pick rails all the way around. You could lighten this up some if you went with M-lock solutions and things like that, but that really doesn't detract from the rifle's capabilities. One of the other features that it, it makes use of is that stepped down bolt. So we have a 30 caliber bolt head and the first half of the bolt carrier would be 30 caliber size and then it steps down to a standard M4 diameter bolt carrier back here by my index finger. That we, we've seen in several different other rifles that, that are popular these days, so it's not a new concept but I do like it because it, it, it's a, it allows you to shorten the firearm considerably back here and use standard M4 accessories like stocks that I currently have on the gun. It has a standard T-handle charging, and on top we have a Trijicon uh, LPVO. And this goes to another discussion that I kindly of wanted to briefly touch upon, the whole recce rifle thing and LPVOs and their use. They do have their uses. Now you can obviously use a 5.56 rifle, which shoots around about that big, or you can use something like this rifle that shoots around about that big. So in terms of doing something like overwatch and scanning for 
potential threats and things like that, and then reaching out and touching something at distance, the 30 caliber cartridge is going to have a distinct advantage over the 55 grain M193 ball. Now, of course, there are heavier ball rounds that are available, the M855 and things like that, but typically M193 or 55 grain ammunition is the most commonly used here in the United States. Basically, this is one third the weight of the 30 caliber, so it's not exactly one third for you mathematicians out there, but closely. So you can carry three rounds of 5.56 versus one round of 308. But the trade off is you get more distance and power on target at extended ranges that you just simply can't get with the 55 grain rifle. So if you're looking at building a recce rifle, you know, maybe you could step out of the norm, step away from the 5.56, and take a look at the 308. And a lot of people do. The 308 is a very capable cartridge, very commonly available. And in rifles like this, especially with match ammunition, it's capable of minute of man or minute accuracy, minute of man being worse, minute of angle being pretty good. And one MOA is not uncommon with this rifle using federal gold medal match 160 grain ammo. So we have also the capability because it uses standard SR25 type magazines. We can use 20 rounders like the one here, 25 rounders, and I believe we brought out a D50 mag pull just to show you guys and talk about some of its limitations with some of the other firearms that we have out here. So 20 rounds, 25 rounds, and 50 round drums are commonly available just from mag pull alone. So it's not like you have to give up much in terms of capacity. You only give up five rounds with this magazine versus a standard Stenag 30 round magazine for a 5.56, but you get the weight that goes along with it. But this would not be my choice it's close, it's real close, but this would not be my choice if I were to pick a 30 caliber fighting rifle. But that does not mean I do not enjoy this firearm a lot. Now this rifle is heavy, but it is, because of that weight, going to have slightly less perceived recoil. You're gonna be able to keep it on target for follow-up shots easier than you would, say, an early AR-10 that was extremely lightweight, several pounds lighter than this rifle. But because of its weight, it makes it very pleasant to shoot, and you can even see your own bullets hitting the target downrange. You can watch the bullet splash because the recoil isn't so bad that it makes the gun completely jump off target. A solid choice, but not what I would personally choose. Without a doubt, one of the most popular 30 caliber rifles out there is the SCAR. This is the rifle that beat the 901 in the military trials. This rifle is extremely popular on the civilian market, so much so the prices just keep going up and people continue to pay them just because they want to own one. The SCAR is a very lightweight rifle. It defies logic in terms of how lightweight it is, yet is still capable of minute of angle accuracy, one MOA with match ammunition fairly consistently. The gun shoots extremely well, is very lightweight, has a side folding stock, so you don't have that receiver extension out here like you would on an M16 type firearm, where the 901 is a direct gas impingement rifle. This one is a piston driven rifle. So a lot of the AR-10s out there are gonna be direct gas impingement, and you'll still find rifles out there in the AR-10 category that will be piston driven. So that is another choice that you would have to make. I'm a DI kind of guy. So when I shoot AR-10s or AR-15s, I prefer um, to use direct gas impingement. But one thing you're going to find with just about every AR-10 on the market is that if you put a traditional baffle can on it, you may or may not get your rifle having really big problems with regards to reliability. They tend to stumble. And I know people are going to argue with me and say, oh man, I got X and X suppressor with baffles in it on my AR-10, bone stock, no adjustable gas block, and I fired 10 million rounds and it's never malfunctioned. Everybody I know that has an AR-10 and a baffled can has to do something to try to tune that gun to get it back to being reliable. With a piston gun, you do have the option of adjusting the gas on most of them, not all of them. So that's something to else to take into consideration. The SCAR, you can suppress it and it'll run just fine uh, with baffled cans or flow through cans like the OSS. This gun makes extensive use of polymers, so much so that, uh, you know, some guys in the military would say that the Ugg boot stock here is way too flimsy. You'll notice that I won't 
slap these stocks closed. I'll push them closed because even the latch is plastic, but there are metal upgrades out there. Uh, but they did everything they could to keep the weight down on the, the, the rifle. So you have a monolithic rail that runs clear out to here to the front sight, which is also the gas block. But here's the other thing. And this is up for debate. I can't speak from experience because I've never destroyed an optic on a SCAR-17. But it has been said that these things are absolutely horrific when it comes to uh, electronic sights, laser designators, thermals, and even magnified optics. These things have a tendency to munch them, destroy them because of the recoil impulse. It has just as much recoil uh, impulse going rearward as it does forward given how the, the bolt and carrier system works in the gun. Uh, only other guns out there that are hard on optics like that, it's said to be BB guns for the same reason. Now, I've never destroyed an optic on a SCAR-17, but then again, I've not fired tens of thousands of rounds through a SCAR-17 to find that out personally. So I just want to make that known out there that that is a concern and it's widely circulated. I just can't confirm or deny it based on my own experiences. I've never broken an optic on a SCAR. The SCAR has the ability to put the charging handle on either side so it would be left hand friendly. Sadly, it has a reciprocating charging handle, which means when you fire the gun, if you have your thumb here, you're gonna cause a malfunction. If you, so you're gonna to wanna to grab it forward, and that's why this hand stop is out here, so it keeps it away from the charging handle on the rifle. This is a Geisley rail, this is an, an older one. Actually, I think, I'm sorry, this is a Kinetic uh, Dev Group rail. Geisley does make a rail for these, but this is an older uh, Kinetic Dev Group rail on the gun. Shooting it, it runs its own magazines, SCAR mags. They're 20 round magazines. The flat dark earth ones will come from the factory painted half flat dark earth. Uh, they do not accept standard um, SR25 magazines or P mags. Now, when there was a very, very long dry spell of these magazines while, the, while um, FN was supplying these to the military, uh, they had to produce so many magazines to deliver with each SCAR to the military that the, there was a shortage for quite some time of the magazines for the rifles. That caused some companies to go out and machine out of aluminum lowers for the guns that would accept standard SR25 magazines. There's no real reason for that anymore. The magazines are fairly common and easy to get these days and they're not horridly expensive. I did have one of those aluminum lowers and I found it to be unreliable. It just wasn't well made. And so I never wound up using it on a SCAR. So, with that being said, this gun with this muzzle brake on it uh, is very, very flat shooting despite its light weight. We are shooting some federal 150 grain ball. A standard military ball round would be 147 grains, but 150 grain is, uh, is pretty common. And this is supplied to us by our friends over at Federal for free. We wanna thank them for supporting the channel. I've been shooting federal ammunition since I was a kid and uh, I absolutely love this stuff. So it's a real pleasure to work with them. All right, so we have an EOTech red dot sight on here, and let's do a little bit of shooting with the SCAR-17. That, with that muzzle device, despite its light weight, is extremely pleasant to shoot, at least as much so as the much heavier, or I should say heavier, uh, much is kind of uh, subjective, the heavier 901. This thing is a very, very nice shooting rifle. But once again, this would not be the rifle I would choose if I were going to pick a 308 as a fighting rifle. The next rifle to consider would be a bullpup. I'm a huge fan of bullpups for any number of reasons. I'm not gonna delve into those reasons. I have other videos out there explaining why I think the bullpup is a great fighting rifle. This is rather unique on the marketplace. There are a couple of different options out there. This is the Tavor 7. Uh, you do have the Desert Tech MDR. I like that gun, I use it for hunting. It's extremely accurate. I have mine set up for 6.5 Creedmoor. But if I was going to choose a battle rifle, I would lean more towards the Tavor 7. You also have things like the R, uh, let's see, the RDB and the RFB, forward eject. So it's the RFB, which is the 30 caliber one. The RDB is 5.56 and downward ejecting. But the kel 308 Bullpup is a good gun. I've had fun with mine. It's just not something that I would consider to be military tough. It's just not to the same level as the Tavor 7. As far as the Tavor 7 goes, this, I don't believe, is in any major use by any military in the world. I think it was made primarily for the U.S. market because the United States really loves its 308, and I'm no exception. I have no shortage of 30, uh, 308 caliber firearms. But what does this bring to the table over the AR-10 or the SCAR? <clears throat> well, I think that's fairly obvious. 
This rifle has a 16 inch barrel, just like the 901 or the SCAR that we've shown you so far. Now I have the 901 set up in the firing position. I have the stop stock slightly extended. They both have 16 inch barrels and you can clearly see the Tavor 7. You don't have to extend the stock to shoot it. Just the way it is, it's ready to go. And uh, it's considerably shorter than the 901. Now with the 901, with its stock collapsed for storage, still the Tavor 7 has the length advantage. If you're talking about AR-10s or any type of gas-operated rifle for maximum reliability, we are huge fans of the OSS. The OSS su suppressor, which I'm putting on the Tavor 7 right now, is what's called a flow-through or a zero back pressure can. It does not overgas the rifle. Therefore, you're not going to have to tinker with adjustable gas blocks and all that other nonsense with an AR-10. Just put an OSS on it and your problem is solved with reliability issues. So, well, let's take a look at this, though. So here we have the OSS can on the Tavor 7, and I have the stock collapsed for storage on the 901, and it's still slightly shorter than the 901 with its factory muzzle device. Bull pups are amazing. Now the Tavor 7 also makes extensive use of polymers, which makes it somewhat lightweight, but it's not as light as the SCAR, but it does balance much better. The rifle is a gas piston design. You have an adjustable uh, gas regulator out here on the end and it has built-in QD points here and here and they're present on both sides of the rifle. You can uh, also set this gun up to be a true left-handers rifle. Uh, this ejection port can be moved over to the other side of the rifle very easily with tools. You can move the charging handle from the left-hand side to the right-hand side and it already has an ambi selector lever, selector lever that's present on both sides of the gun but you can move this bigger one over to the other side if you like. You just put a little uh, like a paper clip in this hole, push it down, slide it off, and reverse the uh, selector lever. So you have the larger one over here if you're a left-handed shooter. And then we have the magazine release, which is present on both sides of the rifle, right there where you'd expect it to be for something like the AR-15. On top of this one, I have an Elcan Spectre DR 1.5 to 6 power. This rifle is amazing. It uses standard SR-25 type magazines, so you'll be able to load... 20 rounders, 25 rounders, but that's kind of where it stops. Things like the D50, <laughs> it'll go in there, but getting your wrist around it to shoot it is awkward at best. Could it be done? Yes, but magazines like this are far better suited for rifles like the 901, not very well suited for bull pups. Drums on bull pups just generally are a no-go. So you don't have that capability of putting a 50 round mag in there if that's something that really matters to you. Let's see if she, we got her zeroed. I believe we do. Very, very flat shooting rifle. Just a ton of fun to shoot and amazing in every way. I love this. It's the ultimate in 30 caliber bull pups. And if I was going to pick a fighting rifle, this would be it. <laughs> I love the T7. That's why it's set up with an L can on it. That's why it has the OSS suppressor on it. It's because I shoot it quite a bit. I enjoy the snot out of it. It can hold its own accuracy wise against the 901 and the SCAR. Uh, you may lose a half a minute of accuracy going from one minute to 1.5 minute, uh, but I've shot one minute groups with it, but it, it's usually just a hair over a minute more than enough combat accuracy, and that's using match ammunition. With just standard ball, it was shooting all the way out to 200 meters, and it just easily connects. A great gun that has sling mounting points that are already there. The other rifles, uh, you can, with the SCAR, you, you can put something out of the M-lock rail or something forward on it. I can't recall if the, the factory SCAR has a sling swivel there or not. The 901 has uh, sling swivel mounts forward and aft, so you can easily put a sling on it. And the Tavor 7 is the same way. When it comes to maintenance, the AR-10s are a breeze, the SCAR's a breeze, and this thing's a breeze as well. Just in the end, the bull pup, in my mind, will always beat out the conventional rifle simply because of its size and weight, typically. But man, when it comes to putting 
30 caliber rounds down range. If you haven't shot a T7, I highly recommend you give one a try if you can, because I think you're gonna fall in love with it. I certainly have, and if I had to pick a go-to-war rifle in 30 caliber, this would be my one, this would be my favorite. It is my favorite, I love the thing. At the end of the day, guys, it's ultimately gonna boil down to personal preference. The three rifles I've shown you here today would be ideal candidates for a fighting rifle. And there's a lot more out there than the three that I've shown here. These are just examples of different types of firearms that are available in 30 caliber. So choose what's right for you. Yes, I like bull pups. I'm kind of the outlier. A lot of people don't like them. I don't understand why not. I don't know if it's just they've never really used them or they just think they're too short. I don't know, or they think the controls are awkward. Granted, Americans, myself included, we're used to the controls on rifles like this because the AR-15, M16, AR-10 is America's rifle and there are far more AR-15s in circulation than any other type of rifle in the United States that's self-loading. And I hope that number continues to grow. But yeah, just choose what's right for you guys. The 901, I love a lot. If you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, guys, we're not supported by the gun companies. We're supported by you, our viewing audience, so we can bring you honest, unbiased information as humanly possible. My opinion's excluded. Everybody has their own opinion. If you'd like to support us, guys, there's a link down to Patreon below. Join our Patreon family. There you get behind-the-scenes information, early release access to videos, and direct access to us. We answer all private communications. Also, right here on YouTube, there is a little join button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Give that join button a click, check out some of the perks, and consider supporting us right here on YouTube. And last but not least, guys, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you for 13 years of support. Happy New Year's, even though it's a little bit late. We'll talk to you guys soon.